Coming. It is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Chen Tan from uh, New York University. Uh, Chen is a PhD student working with uh, Michael Warfish, and uh, his work has been focusing on, as the title suggests, to suggest it, auditing outsourced services. And one of his works has won the Best Paper Award from SOSP, and uh, he will give us more details about it today. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. So yeah, so as uh, Xian mentioned, so my research are in systems and security. I also work a little bit on network systems and mobile systems. So in today's talk, I'll mainly focus on the question of how to verify the, uh, the execution of an application running on untrusted servers. So this is one of the fundamental questions in system security. Answering this question could enable user to recognize whether their remote service behaved as expected or as promised in addition, it also can help people understand for their local services whether there are internal unexpected failures or external attacks. So why should people care about these questions? Well, people should care because remote servers, namely cloud, make mistakes. We've seen various cloud incidences that subvert the execution of a service because of bugs, misconfigurations, and unexpected failures. More importantly, Cloud providers themselves might not be fully trustworthy. So in 2019, there is a startup company who sued Tencent Cloud, the second largest cloud provider in mainland China, for downgrading the accuracy of their machine learning model. Because there's another department within Tencent who was competing with this startup company. So unfortunately, this case is still unsettled because the startup company cannot provide concrete evidence showing that the cloud provider did uh, misbehave. So because of all of these questions, I'm motivated to build systems that can verify outsourced services. So for today's outsourced services, they are no longer single program. They're actually sets of cooperative services. For example, a web application will often include a database at the back end a key value store as a cache, or a search service, and et cetera. So in this talk, I will introduce systems that can verify these services with systems approach, including like deterministic record replay, consistent checking, or time travel database, and et cetera. It will become much more precise later, but by verify, or the guarantee of this verification is that an honest server can always convince its users that it faithfully executes the execution, whereas a buggy or a malicious server can never fool its users. Okay, so more generally, the topic here is called execution integrity. Uh, execution integrity studies how to ensure a piece of code executes as written. This is separate from, but complementary to, program verification which is about writing bug-free code. You can imagine that even if a, an application is bug-free, it still can produce wrong result under untrusted environment. So execution integrity is a broad topic that has been examined by multiple communities. I will map this work in this two high-level, uh, in this high-level trade-off where the x-axis is how much trust one puts to the remote servers and on the y-axis is the performance overhead. You can think of this as how many resources you have to pay to get uh, this verifiability. So up to the right is better. The first thing you could do is to replicate your application to multiple servers, collect their results, and to see if they agree. So there are beautiful and deep theories behind this approach. However, as a solution of execution integrity, they make some assumptions about remote servers, namely, a certain number of servers have, have to be honest. Another approach is attestation where remote server have these hardware or software trusted components. And by trusting these pieces only, user could e establish the trust to the whole system. However, again, so the assumption here, there are such pieces and they are indeed trustworthy. Another line of work called probabilistic checkable proofs, including SNARKs, interactive proofs, 
uh, arguments, PCPs, and etc., which are based on the cryptographic and complexity theories, they put zero trust on the remote servers, which are desirable. However, they impose outrageous overhead on the server side. And my solution lands here with zero trust on the remote servers and low over, uh, performance overhead. But of course, there are trade-offs, as we all know that system design is really about making trade-offs. Compared with replication and then testation, my solution is offline verification, meaning that there will be a delay on detecting incorrect behaviors. Compared with probabilistic checkable proofs, we sacrifice some generality where we target specific services with real-world workloads. But despite these trade-offs, I still believe we make significant progress in this two-dimensional di space. So in order to achieve this goal on outsource services, so my vision is to build this verifiable infrastructure where all the built-in uh, services are verifiable, and for an application running on top of this framework, so the user could verify this application without putting any trust into the framework. So just a little bit of detail, so there will be a verifier. Think of this as a local machine in your office that will compute this verification and inform the users. So in order to do this, there are st three steps. The first is that the verifier should be able to verify white box services, meaning that the user could uh, look into the internal states of this service and potentially modify its source code. However, a lot of cloud services are black box. So the second step is to verify black box services, meaning that uh, users have no visibility into the implementation or deployment or internal states of this service. And uh, it, will be it, it is a challenge that uh, how we can compose uh, these multiple different verifications. Uh, this will lead to the rest of my talk. First, I will introduce two systems, Orochi and Cobra, to answer the first two questions. And then I will introduce my future works about how to build a composable and verifiable uh, framework. And uh, at last, uh, I will very briefly mention one of uh, my other work, which I've done here as an intern. Uh, which has a similar flavor, but in a very different domain, about troubleshooting uh, in a data center network. So uh, on to the first topic. Let's start with some concrete examples. Imagine there's a company whose employees use a web application. And one employee named Dana is given the responsibility of deploying this application. So for convenience and performance, Dana wants to deploy this application on some cloud platform, say AWS. But lots of things can go wrong in this setup. There might be bugs, attacks, misconfigurations, etc. happens in any layer of this execution, tag, execution stack, which might result in uh, employees seeing incorrect responses. And uh, it will beca become really tedious to, pro to prove to Dana that every single layer of this execution functions correctly, right? So, and soon we realize that what Dana really wants to know is that the full set of all responses is consistent with having executed the original applications on the deliver request. So, one straight straightforward question is, uh, what about uh, re-execute everything and compare the regenerated uh, responses with the delivered one. So in order to, to see what's wrong with this naive approach, let me first rigorously define what is the problem, which we call the efficient server audit problem. So before diving into details, I want to mention that uh, this problem turned out to be much harder than I thought, because there are several challenges which are not obvious in the first place. So in the next 20 minutes, I will try to communicate what exactly the problem is, which is part of our contribution, as well as what makes this problem hard. So there will be this server with a, a program, and there's this online phase where the server creates one thread for one request, like HTTP request, and uh, deliver the responses, which is supposed to be the output of this program. And we put a collector here that 
capture the actual request and actual responses flows into and out of the server, which we'll call a trace. So you can imagine that uh, this collector could be a middle box at the edge of the company's network, which captured inter, uh, uh, the communication between the uh, web application and the employees. So periodically, there will be this audit phase conduct conducted by this verifier who gets in this trace and must answer the question, were the delivered responses truly derived from the, this program and the delivered requests? So if the answer is yes, the verifier should accept. Otherwise, uh, it should reject. And there are two settings and two requirements make this problem unique. First is we put zero trust on the server, meaning that server can behave arbitrarily. Second is this server is concurrent, meaning that these concurrent threads can concurrently uh, interact with these shared objects. Essentially, these are the states of this program. And then we require the verifier to spend less computation power than the server, because otherwise, why not just hold host the application on the verify in the first place. And finally, we require the server's overhead to be low and ideally can support legacy applications. And it is this four characteristic make this problem new and unique. So now let's revisit our previous question that verify can, why not, that verify re-execute everything and uh, compare the regenerated responses with the delivered ones. Well, this approach cannot solve our problem because the verifier will spend as much or even more work than the server. And more interestingly, so due to concurrencies, so actually verify must explore exponentially many schedules because it doesn't, like, it doesn't know what the actual schedule on the server side, right? And in the following, we will address these two high-level questions, one of which is naive re-execution doesn't save work. So our proposal is we can somehow accelerate re-execution, which I will tell you in a second. And the second problem is there are many schedules to explore. So our proposal is we can ask the server for extra information, which we call advice, and use this advice, but does not trust it. And actually, these two high-level questions are not isolated. They are intertwined, which makes the whole problem even harder. So come to the uh, first problem. So at a very high level, so our approach is that we observe there are repeated computation among different execution of the same program. So we can ask the server to keep track of this repeated computation, inform the verifier through a device, and the verifier can deduplicate this reputation. Actually, the underlying, yes. Exactly, yeah, I will talk about that. The, because the server is totally untrusted, this advice is untrusted. So this advice, what is the ground truth here? Are you going to use that advice or not use that advice? So, okay, so the ground truth is the inputs and output, namely the request and the response. These are the ground truths. About these advice are some actual information we do not trust. Okay, so I, I also I will like, uh, mention what, like how we can use this advice, but that does not trust this advice. Okay, we'll see. Okay, so this underlying observation is not new. It's actually borrowed from prior work called Parole. So Perot's author uh, observed and we confirmed that there are repeated computation among web applications. So here is a two pages of hot crap. I'm pretty sure many of you are very familiar with this. So we will see that even there, the, the submission of papers, titles, and uh, like author names are different. If we look into their execution of PHP, uh, these, these are PHP bytecode here they actually share the same control flow. Not only the control flow, they actually have a lot of identical instructions. By that, I'm, I mean that uh, the opcode and operands both are the same for those instructions, then we call it identical instructions. So it sort of makes sense, because if we see these two pages, they're rendered similarly, given 
they have different values for some part of the page. So it makes sense they have a lot of uh, uh, repeated computation among these two pages. Just to be clear that Parole is a record replay system, which fundamentally trusts its recorder, in this case the server, uh, which conflicts with our setup. So our solution will not trust the server. So it works as follows. During online phase, the server will keep track of the control flow of each of the execution. And uh, the advice from this server to the verifier will be a map that's mapping from this opaque tag, which represents the control flow, to a set of request identifiers, which supposedly share the same control flow. And in the verifier, it will iterate over uh, these uh, tags and execute a bunch of requests that supposed to uh, supposedly share the same control flow in an accelerated and batch manner, which we call SIMD on demand, uh, which briefly depict at the bottom of the slides. The point of this mode is that for those identical instructions, it will only re-execute them once. So as you mentioned that the advice from the server to verify is untrusted because the server is untrusted. So the verifier will conduct a, a unanimity check where it will check at every jump point to see whether all the requests in this group will head it the same way. If they are, meaning that they actually share the same control flow. If they diverge, the verifier will reject. Yes? Intuition for why the server can't use this trick to memoize computation and thereby gain the same computational uh, speed up that the verifier does? Good point. So intuitively, intuitively or at a very high level, the reason why the verifier can use this is because this is the second time they've seen this request. By that, I mean it first executed by the server. If it's honest, then the verifier actually knows some hints about these requests, right? But think about if you, if you at the server, you see some two requests with some input, how could you possibly know whether they have the share the same control flow or not? If they are not, then you are wasting some cycles on batching them together. They will diverge eventually, right? Okay, so now let me uh, elaborate what is this SIMD on demand re-execution with a concrete example. Suppose we have this program with two inputs A and B. So because there's no branch here, so this request one and two share the same control flow. And for the verifier, we need to see this variable has different values among different executions. It will conduct what we call a multi-value variable, essentially a vector here. And for any instructions whose operand is this multi-value variable, it will run them in a SIMD single instruction multiple data way, right? And crucially, if all the elements within one variable, in this case C, are the same, so the verifier will clap it, collapse it into a Scala, in this case integer two. And for others, those are identical, the instructions that are identical, it will only re-execute it once instead of n times where n is the number of requests in this group. So yes. So a web app, for example, Hotcraft, right? A lot of this instruction is just displaying a web page, mm -hmm. right? That's got nothing to do with the correctness of the computation. The computation says if I retrieve a paper, I retrieve the right paper. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying when I when you re-execute, why are you even rerunning the code that displays the web page? That seems like irrelevant computation. It doesn't go to the core of what makes the computation correct. So can't you just even skip rendering a web page? Why is that relevant to check rechecking? You see what I'm saying? You run some function and you so, just display the results of the function in a web page. But uh, I mean, rendering a page is also some computation, right? Because you can generate, a, for example, a different HTML page or a like different layout of a HTML page, right? That can be considered as a uh, incorrect. incorrect computation, right? But computation not doesn't necessarily. I'm guessing for something like hot crap. Yes. You could get away with rendering of web pages to a large extent because that is not typically going to. Uh, what are you concerned with hot crap? And I ask for a paper, you return a different paper. That's fault behavior. That's saying, definitely. Uh, that's something to think about. Maybe you could get rid of a lot more computation. Like, 
it seems like in many web apps, the rendering of the page is irrelevant to the correctness of the computation. Just a thought. Maybe, maybe not. Okay. So, I mean, yeah, that sort of makes sense. I think it depends on your definition of input and output. Yeah. Right? So if your output is a web page. Yeah, but, it, but it, could, it could be the things that populate the web page, right? We just stick at that. And then the web page is common, just renders three fields. And the output is just the value of the three fields. Then you can just get rid of, it seems, I don't know. You're correct. It depends on how you define the problem. Okay, so just uh, to recap that, uh, yeah, so our accelerated re-execution actually re-executed everything, but in an accelerated way. So we use this advice, but does not trust this advice. Okay, so now come to the second problem that uh, we might have, the, because of concurrency, we might have to explore many uh, possible schedules. So yes? So how is the verifier keeping track of all the inputs? Because otherwise, you cannot do this re-execution to get any trust out. So that's a huge thing. Yeah, so we will require that we will see the trees Right, so we will require this trace, meaning the, all the requests and responses here. So the verify stage is huge? Uh, by huge, you, I mean, then verify you need to... track of all the inputs? Yes. When you get back the trace? Yes, yeah, so think of this as the, like how many HTTP, HTTP requests and response from the server, right? Okay, so it really depends on... The verifier. What? You're storing them explicitly at the verifier? Yes. Okay. For some time, because uh, after you verify all of them, you can throw them away, right? I see. Do we need to correlate the different requests, uh, response, and do you even need to duplicate the database on the verify side? Yeah, code? so we need to duplicate. We need to rebuild the database on the verifier. Okay. So you will see that at the story, uh, like we have at least one X overhead for storage. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, benefits to, we have to collect a trace for a period of time. Yes. Right? So is that that depends on the nature of the data and the request and response, or is there a specific heuristic to decide how much data should be collected before verifiers can optimize the actual computation? So I believe the like uh, <clears throat> I believe it's fundamental you need all the request and all the response. This is not Part of the solution is actually part of the problem. It's a prerequisite of the problem. Because think of, if you like, don't know parts of the input, like parts of the request or parts of the response, there's really no problem you're trying to solve. Because, right? So you don't know the input, some of the inputs, then you never know what the actual state of the program is. Right. right. I mean, but Okay, we can follow up later. Yeah, but okay. if you're doing this in a streaming fashion, how do you decide when to verify? Like, I'm oh. getting a bunch of requests. Yeah. How, how do I know? So basically for us, that will be periodical. Like, uh, you can think, okay, so for every hour, so all the requests and response in the last hour, I will try to verify them. And then if you're done, you just throw them away. But of course, you have to keep the database on the verifier. And then for the next hour, you try to verify them. So like this periodical round by round verification. Yes. I think the, the earlier question, push card question is about how do you have a minimal requirement for the batch size to get a reasonable performance, if I understand. Oh, no. oh sorry. So no. That is that batch size. Getting it, yeah. Yeah. Oh, so, I'm sorry. So, yeah. uh, yes, we need, because uh, our re-execution, the reason why we can accelerate them because they are repeated computation, right? So. Uh, for sure, we need some number of requests so that we can save some CPU cycles. But in terms of how many, this really depends on the application and the workload. So for you, you will see uh, our evaluation. Roughly at that point, we are roughly in the uh, 10,000 or 100,000 requests, sort of like that way. OK, so the second question. So actually, this problem is deeply rooted in the fact that this server is both concurrent and untrusted. To see why, suppose we have this honest concurrent server given a concurrent request, a set of concurrent requests. There are many possible valid uh, 
responses, right? Because it depends on what the actual schedule is. Then the question is, if this server is untrusted, how could the verifier possibly know whether the delivery responses is one instance of a large set of possible valid responses? So a standard way is just to ask the server to provide extra information, and then which can narrow the possible valid responses. But then the question here is, how can the verifier know the device is trustworthy? And in order to articulate the problem, let me introduce our concurrency model first, and then you will see what the advice is. And uh, for our server, we will create one thread for one request, which has its local memory and registers. And uh, for the concurrent transactions, they can issue operations to a shared object. Uh, for here, uh, in this talk, that let's assume that shared objects are registers that expose a read-write API. But in reality and in our build system, these objects can be complicated objects like a database or keyword stores. And then the device will be an ordered list of these operations, which essentially the actual execution order of all the operations to this particular object. Then the real question is, OK, so can we simply re-execute according to this op logs so uh, we can verify it. Yes? This op log is something you have to implement in the server because, for instance, a traditional database transaction log will not keep yes. track of the reads. It will only keep track of the writes. Yes. So you uh, have to modify the server explicitly to track this. So that's why this problem, I call it white box service. Yes, so for our build system, we have to modify MySQL. We have to modify the Kyoto store to extract uh, this uh, schedule. Actually, it's a not uh, easy task because think about concurrent concurrency control protocols, right? You have to find the correct place to extract these schedules. Yeah, but we, we need to modify. More than just extracting them, you need to serialize them more than they otherwise would have been. Yes, that's correct. Yes. So yeah, for this uh, build systems, we have to modify my signal. Yes. Do you have to verify the order is possible? Yeah, that's what I'm going to say. Okay. Thank you for the question. <laughs> yeah, so the question is, can we just uh, simply according to the op logs and we're done? The answer is no. And here's why using example. Suppose we have these two requests, which interact with two shared objects, x and y, which in initially to be 0. So uh, for the first request, it will write x to be 1 and then read from y and output y's value. Similarly, request two, uh, it has similar behavior, but swap x and y. Suppose we have this choice that request one comes and request two comes. And request one leaves with output to be one and the request two output one. The question is, should a verify accept or reject this? We should accept because here's a possible valid schedule is that request one comes and write x to be one, and request two comes and write y to be one, and then just keep running and output two ones. And let's call this uh, example A. And here's example B with similar trees, but both output to be zero. So should we accept this? We should reject because for whatever schedule you have, the very first operation would be a write to either x or to y, right? So at this point, when any request li uh, leaves, so the x or y has to be 1. But uh, this conflicts with the fact that both of the outputs are 0. So we should reject this. And uh, suppose these are op logs provided by the server. So next, I'm trying to convince you that re-execute according to op log, we will wrongly accept this case B. So let's simulate the verifier and re-execute these requests according to these op logs. First, we will write x to be 1, and we see there's write 1 in the op log. Good. And then we will read from, a, or from y. And we realize that we are very first operation in this log, so we, we will return the default value, which is 0. And we will output 0, and which is consistent with in, uh, whatever in the trace. And then we 
we execute uh, request, B, uh, request 2, and we'll write y to be 1, and we'll read from x, which returns 0, and we will output 0. And we will wrongly accept uh, this case B. So there are millions of ways that uh, server could sabotage the, ver the verifier by tweaking these op logs. I will not uh, introduce all of them today, but uh, just to give you a flavor of what's go going wrong in this case B, it is that if we see on the left that uh, the operation order within this request, which we call program order, and draw these happen before relationship in these four operations, we will see a cycle here, meaning that these four operations cannot consistently order. Well, it turned out that in order to validate the, these alleged op, op logs, we will require information from the trees, from the program, and also from these op logs. And our solution, consistent to ordering verification, essentially will build a direct, direct graph with all the information from above and check if it's acyclic. If it's so, then there exists a sequential order of all operations that is consistent with the trees and also with the program. Yes. So you are assuming the shell object follows the sequential consistency model. Oh, yeah, yeah. So we are assuming the sequential consistency here. Okay. And are you assuming the program is sort of deterministic? What if the ordering can change? There's some non-determinism in the program? Logic? Yes. So I, I will talk about that in okay. the next slides. Yes. How do you handle requests across machines? I can see if everything is sort of hitting a memory and you have control, but once requests sort of propagate in a distributed manner, how are you going to consider all the orderings of those? Good question. So for this uh, system we built, so we're targeting single node PHP applications, like LAMP, these uh, applications. So everything runs on a single machine? Mm -hmm. For this, yes. Across multiple cores or single core? So for each of the requests, there will be one thread, right? And of course, you can, if you have concurrent requests, you can run them in multiple cores. So our concurrency model is that uh, uh, they will concurrently interact with some shared object, and this shared object too. Uh, okay, so there's a single memory. Yes, but the, you can think of this shared, shared object can also be shared memory. But uh, in that case, the performance might have some problem because memory access can be really frequent. Yes. What's the granularity on this shared object? Make sure I think that is like the whole DB that I'm necessarily realizing. Yes. Or, okay. So for us, for this build, like you will see this uh, build uh, system called Orochi. Mm -hmm. So there are three types of shared object. One is database, MySQL. One is key value store. Another is uh, session data, so for web applications. So I mean, my, my core question is, like, if, if we've got this LAMP stack, we've got many threads. Yes. When I actually think about running this on server, it seems like I'm actually taking a lock on a very large object just to run this one. Like, and so I'm going to have to say, this, this, this goes to the point about scale. Yeah. Right? Uh, like, OK. So are you asking that? Uh, what kind of uh, isolation level for the database, or? It, it's more like, so I've got, my, I've got my one thread, it's running one request. Yes. Um, if I have to lock the entire DB, nobody else can touch the DB whilst I'm working. Oh, that I see. That sucks for scale. If yes. I have to say, oh, well, no key else can mess with the specific keys that I play with, that, that makes sense. OK, so, so like I guess, I guess the concrete answer to that will be, so we don't care whether that shared object uh, is a distributed one or whatever, as far as it can provide us with that op log, which is a sequential schedule of the operations, that will be fine. For the database case, one of the operations will be a SQL statement, right? Or a transaction, actually, if you were. And uh, as our verifier, we don't really care how you can get that. But in our build system, we modify the MySQL to get that. Okay, so sounds like sounds good. So we can, you know, uh, validate these op logs, but actually, the actual problem is even harder to see why I have to t take a lie or a simplification from you. That is, the operations within this request is fixed and known, so they are actually regenerated during re-execution. If you see this new request one prime, 
Whether we will issue a write to x is actually dependent on the value of y, which means that in order to validate this upload, they will require program order, as I stated earlier. But in order to get this program order from this re-execution, it actually de also depends on the uplocks here. And what makes this program even harder is that our re-execution is an out-of-order and re-accelerated uh, one. So in order to address these problems, we need a co-design of uh, these two parts at a very high level. So uh, Orochi intertwined these two procedures of re-execution and consistent ordering with various checks to make sure that these two procedures are consistent with each other. For example, we will check for all the operations, regenerated operations, that they are not duplicated or uh, omitted in the uplocks. And indeed, so Orochi had this verification protocol, which is proved to be correct. So I'm happy to talk more about details if you got interested uh, during questions or offline. OK, so uh, we've ex experimented our system with three applications, uh, a wiki, uh, media wiki, a bulletin board, PHP BB, and the hot crap. On these three uh, real-world workloads. And what we've seen is that Orochi's verifier uh, has multiple times speed up versus, versus the baseline, which is naive re-execution. The reason why the baseline is naive re-execution is that we don't know any other way to comprehensively audit a web application. So what this graph is that, that uh, we have 10.9, 4.6, and 6.2 speed up uh, versus uh, this naive replay. Yes. I'm just, I did, you know, a lot of work on um, recorder and replay, and yes. also when you replay something, you see great time improvements because you removed all the I/O. Okay. And I'm just curious if these speed ups reflect that, or if they reflect sort of the use of so, SIMD collapse of parallel requests. Yes. So if you see these blue parts, that come from the PHP, and the difference here will indicate uh, the benefits of the SIMD. Uh, for example, for Wiki, uh, media wiki, so for naive re replay, it will have this uh, 500 seconds. Mm -hmm. But for re-execute, we only have, I don't know, 80 seconds. That's the benefit of our SIMD on demand right, execution. So during your naive replay, are you also seeing IO? Are you forming IO or see yes. some of the time to complete like talking to a disk? Yes. That, um, that so you're removing that, which other replay systems can also remove. Oh, I see. I mean, Wait, so how, like how, can, years how, old, right? how can you, re by remove, you mean like, in memory or? Well, because you already know, like for example, you do a read system call, and rather than actually talking to the disk in your log, you actually know the answer. So you just I return see. it right away. So you eliminate all the I.O. delays. And so your first, replays get super fast. I see. So first of all, I would say that for the, all the application we have, they are not I/O bound. You can see from the naive replay. So most of the time, I don't know, like seventy percent of time was spent on the CPU PHP, right? This is not about uh, some I/O bound. And uh, yes, you're right. But I have to mention that uh, if you try to cache those uh, whatever uh, intermediate results, you have to remember that our server is untrusted. Basically meaning that all their information we cannot trust. We have to check or validate those. Right, so that's the, okay, so that then is kind of the main difference, which is if I just say to my cloud provider, look, give, do a VM level mm -hmm. recording of all my, uh, all my uh, executions, and then I'll replay them on my own time and they'll be much faster. Mm -hmm. um, then you have to trust the entire deterministic yes. replay log, and there's no nice way of verifying it. Yeah, essentially, we're trying to see whether these are, are, are the correct results. Except right? that I can also, I can still do the VM level replay and verify that the outputs are consistent with the ones that I saw. So by VM level, I guess, I guess like if you recall in the VM level, how could you possibly speed up? the replay. 
Again, because you're getting rid of all of the I.O. from the original execution. Yes, but again, so for this sort of the... So I guess my question is how much, you know, I'm trying to understand how much of um, the speed up is due to this SIMD on demand. So which, the blue part, I would say. Because uh, the blue part is on PHP so this is all of PHP. Yes. So it doesn't actually, I don't know, but maybe, maybe I'm misinterpreting the graphs, but it's not obvious to me mm -hmm. here what contribution SIMD on demand is actually making. So, because uh, you sort of got these this coarse grain PHP DB and other block as opposed to, yeah. yeah so, uh, how much I, time you're spending in each kind of execution? So the the, the number here is how I marry it is that uh, we will like from the kernel we will see how uh, much time spent on the process of this PHP interpreter, right? So this basically meaning that how much CPU cycles you run by the PHP interpreter itself, essentially it's a CPU, uh, I don't know. I see, so this is actually, so it's, it's just not, CPU time, it's not actually end-to-end yeah. uh, -end execution time. So it removes all I.O. time so the I .O. in both come, cases. So, by, so first of all, like, there are not much I.O. for these web applications, right? It might interact with database, keep it a store, and that's pretty much it. They will never, for example, write to files and modify read from files, <coughs> something like that. They're not logging anything? Yeah. What? Like they're not logging anything? Totally in-memory in database? Or? There's no in-memory database for these applications, <coughs> I believe. They're, as I mentioned, so they're all the... They're reading their config files. I mean, every time you execute yeah. a script, it's got to stat the script to see that it hasn't changed on disk. And oh, yeah, they do read from config mm -hmm. files. And they do uh, read from script, but that happens in the very beginning because this is a server, right? right. So this PHP interpreter will load those <coughs> data and cache them in the PHP so itself. Like the, the SQL uh, commands that you were talking about yes, before, the SQL. not interacting with the disk at all. Yes, the SQL and the other like uh, shared objects will go to the red, red part up here. Which again, so when we do this, we is we got uh, these uh, CPU cycles from the kernel about how, how for how long that uh, my SQL that process runs. Yeah. Okay. Uh, maybe we can, we can talk about it. Yeah, we, we might talk this offline. Okay. So and then how about the overhead on the server side, right? This is one workload, which is media wiki. We have this five percent overhead uh, for the CPU. And because we will need the trees and also the advice, that will be roughly 10 kilobytes per request. Compared with our baseline, which also required the trees, that will be about 10% overhead because we need this device, which is additional to that. And yeah, as Xian mentioned, so we will rebuild the database on the verifier. So we at least have one X here. But uh, in terms of dollars, uh, stories are cheap, so we sort of think this overhead are acceptable. And we see similar results for the other, other uh, workloads here. So, okay, so uh, to recap that uh, Orochi Verify addressed these two high-level problems with a accelerated re-execution and a co-design uh, uh, verification protocol. However, this will require white box services. But sometimes for these op logs, they may not be available for some services, like if you're using black box database, right? So the second uh, topic here is I'm trying to introduce this uh, system called Cobra, which can verify serializability of black box database. So first question is why serializability? So many reasons. First, uh, it's a gold standard isolation level and which used by default by many programmers and applications. And also we have seen this new generation of cloud database which claim they are serializable. And also this checking serializability, this problem is fundamental in database and is very challenging. So the setup is as follows that there is a bunch of users who send concurrent transactions to a black box database. 
So by transactions, I mean a set of read and write operations, which all happen together on none of them. What happens? And uh, this database is supposed to be serializable, but it actually can behave arbitrarily. Later, there is this verifier, which gets these transactions and must answer the questions, are these transactions serializable? By definition, that means that there exists a sequential execution of these transactions, which is uh, equivalent to the transaction have seen by the users. So uh, Papa Dimitri answered this question 40 years ago. Basically, the answer is no. There's no polynomial algorithm unless p equal to mp. So the major challenge here is that the serializability does not respect real-time order, meaning that even if a user have seen a transaction happening before another transaction, that does not, not necessarily mean that this transaction will logically be scheduled before the other transaction. For example, like this transaction one, transaction two are perfectly serializable, even the, though they disobey the real-time order. I have to mention that uh, there are similar problems, namely checking strict serializability or, and checking conflict serializability, which are not MP-complete. So, but they require actual information from the database or require database provide stronger consistency level, which some of today's databases uh, do not provide. So despite uh, this is MP-complete problems, so we, our hypothesis is that for real-world workload, there we might uh, can solve this problem. Uh, the intuition comes from the advances of current SAS solvers and SMT solvers and their achievement on heuristically solving hard problems whose general form are NP-complete. So our starting point is actually from Pablo Dimitri's construction, and he had this transformation from concurrent transactions to a, an a uh, combinatorial object, namely a family of graphs. And he proved that if and only if there's one instance in this family that is acyclic, then we can say that these con concurrent transactions are serializable. So, so one uh, approach, or which is our baseline, that we can encode this family of graphs into some SMT clauses and ask an SMT solver to solve this problem for us. But it turned out that uh, this is too hard a problem for SMT solvers. So our system, COBRA, basically strategically narrowed the search space and make the SMT solver's life much easier. So one question is, why cannot SMT solver do what we do? They cannot because we know uh, the semantic of these transactions, which they don't know, and also we observed some common patterns in real-world workloads. Just to give you a flavor here that uh, we have this pruning technique, which will reduce the number of graphs in this family by adding constraints to this family. So there are two questions. So what constraints can, can we learn or can we infer from these uh, uh, reachability information? So uh, here's an example that we have three transactions. And we know that transaction three read X from transaction one. And we know that transaction two had a path to transaction three. So at this point, if we want to have a sequential execution of these three transactions, there are two possibilities because we don't know the order of transaction one and two, right? But if we, you, if we see the semantics of the transactions, we will soon realize that transaction two cannot happen in between transaction one and transaction three because otherwise transaction three would have read X from transaction two instead of transaction one. And transaction two cannot happen after transaction three because they're the path. So transaction two has to happen before transaction one. So essentially by that we uh, have only one graph here. And also, calculating these reachability is expensive, so we delegate this computation to a GPU, which uh, has at least 10 times speed up versus its CPU version. With all previous uh, techniques, so Cobra can have this 
handle this 10 times larger workload uh, versus our baseline, which is use this SMT servers in the first place. So, okay, so now let me introduce my future work, which I've stated is this verifiable infrastructure. So I've introduced the two systems covered two components in this graph. And there are many more open questions, first of which is how can we compose verification of multiple services? So major challenge here is that some services do not respect real-time order. Think of there's an eventual consistent uh, storage, so it can legitimately return arbitrary old value in the history. That will totally confuse our current verifier. I believe one step towards solving this problem is to quantify the leeway of uh, such a, a storage system. So the second question is, besides black box database, what, how about other black box services? In particular, I'm interested in this uh, search, black box search service. It also can be mot motivated by today's decentralized service. So for example, uh, today's decentralized service like Steemit, a decentralized uh, uh, media, uh, social media, or OpenBizarre decentralized uh, marketplace, that if you want to do search on these services, there are really two options. One, you trust some central node, or you download all the data and search locally. Neither is ideal. So I'm motivated to build this verifiable search engine where you got not only the result, but also with the proof that you as a user can check locally and convince yourself that these are the results of my research. Oh, sorry, of my search. So the challenge here is that uh, you need to be verifiable for the whole pipeline of this search and different stage in this pipeline have different characteristics. So all I'm telling you today is about execution integrity. So if we pop up a level, so can we have some system to prove to users other desirable properties like confidentiality or privacy or even metadata privacy? These are very important questions and I believe such a system will require to incorporate some of the cryptographic protocols or primitives. And one step further is that can we have a system to prove rules or even laws, for example, GDPR or CCPA. GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation, has been kicked off in the EU uh, in 2018, and CCPA, California uh, Consumer Privacy Act, has been kicked off in 2020. So can we have a system to prove user about these? So the motivation here is that today's GDPR compliance uh, audit we have to involve human beings, which are uh, expensive, time-consuming, and are pro error prone. So can we have a machine to do this? So the requirement here will be we need a machine checkable definition of GDPR, and we want this audit to put zero trust on the service and should be efficient. And hope, I hope some of the requirements sounds familiar to you, so I'm uh, interested in building such a framework with the technique in Orochi and Cobra. And uh, like uh, I will very, very briefly mention one of another work I've done here at um, uh, Microsoft Research. It's about uh, localizing failures in data center network. So the question we were asking is that, can we pinpoint failures without trusting any failure information from this data network? So it's sort of interesting that we can do this with end-to-end -end observation of the network package loss on the servers only, and we can efficiently and, uh, and accurately pinpoint the failure. And this has already been deployed in uh, Azure's data center and detect many overlooked failures uh, in the last three years. So with that, uh, today, I've introduced my vision of this verifiable infrastructure, which will enable users verify their outsourced services without putting any trust on the framework. I will introduce two systems, Orochi and Cobra, and there are many open questions and many things to do for this uh, framework. So with that, I'm happy to take questions. Yes. 
I have a couple of questions mm -hmm. about sort of the applicability of this, this verification approach. Okay. Um, the first one is about where you capture the trace, where you put this trace collector, because that has to be trusted. And Correct. it seems like having a single trusted centralized point where you can observe all the interaction with the service you want to verify yes. is, a, is a key thing. And clearly the single client scenario is where it, where it works, right? The hospital or whatever that's outsourcing its own private thing to the cloud. Yes. How do we go beyond that? Good, good question. So I think we are on the same page that like this trees uh, is fundamental. We must have this, then we can have this problem, right? And uh, basically the question is, if we have some public facing applications here, how, where should this collector be? If it's on the cloud, how can we trust it, right? Not, not so, necessarily public, even just multi-party private. If it's multi-party private, for example, if you're a company, you have like geo-replicated offices, you no, still can. I, I suppose, okay, I suppose that's what you would call public, right? Some uh, service yeah. that is accessible from multiple mutually distrusting parties. Yes, that's it. Like, yeah, absolutely. So for that scenario, it's uh, still quite an open question. Interestingly, uh, I believe uh, 2019, so from, uh, you, you see, you, from Brian Karp's group, they have this implementation of this collector uh, using SGX. So that it can, uh, you can put this collector on the cloud. If you trust SGX, then you can have this uh, trace how, fifthly. How do you yes. ensure that all of the data has gone through SGX? So how do you ensure that the cloud provider didn't just send some requests and not tell the on cloud? Provider? So the, if that is basically, you are saying that what if the trace is not complete, right? Yes. Then during verify, it will reject, right? Because if, if some request is missing, then if I re-execute everything I've seen in high probability, then that might not work because the other requests will modify the states of the application, which I haven't seen, so I haven't re-execute. So the response it will be... Uh, no, but it, I mean, if the, if the cloud is colluding, right, it can tell the trace collector, oh, here's the request I made, and here's the trace that shows the correct execution of that request I told you I made, but that's no guarantee that it actually, that was the real request or that it handled that request. I think we should, I don't know if this, I mean, you're not even talking about your work here, right? So, yeah, so we so can talk I, to I, about this later. I, I, I guess I'm I think there are big limitations to assuming that an enclave or anything like it is going to see a full fidelity trace. So, okay, so let me fully answer your question here. Yeah. Uh, what I'm saying is that in the setup of you have these public facing applications, yes, that's uh, something I cannot handle right now. So that's a uh, future work. And interestingly, there's other group looking at this problem. So far, we have a SGX implementation. Again, so there are some limitations and it's very interesting to think of this as a service itself saying, okay, so can I have a collector that record everything through it, every traffic through it, can I have this service without putting any trust to this service? Can I have this? Uh, this is a very interesting thing to think of. Yes. yes. Um, maybe I missed it, but what's the online um, overhead of, of doing the recording? So the online overhead would be uh, this much. So this comes from... So this is CP. Yes, this comes from keep track of the control flow, that's one of us, and to keep track of those uh, operations because we need to record them. And also, part of it I haven't mentioned today is the non-determinism function calls, like get time of day and uh, random number, something like that. Do you have throughput numbers? I that do have throughput number. numbers. I, so this is for this workload, and uh, the blue line is basically uh, the native application and the red line is our system. Yes. How, how did you implement the SIMD execution? Was that something you had to do yourself or is that something that you just took an existing uh, Yes. So, uh, so we, we're using PHP, right? So we extend, so for the SIMD part, we actually extend the PHP's type system 
from a uh, you know normal type system with an actual multi-value type. Think about that as uh, we used to only have integer, right? Now we have multi-value integers. Essentially, that's the vector. And whenever there's one instruction like add, whose operands are these multi-value types, then it will run SIMD. Otherwise, it will run normal instructions. And did, did you have to implement your own extension to an interpreter or compiler? Yes, we, we need to implement, we, we need to modify and open source the PHP interpreter, which is hip hop VM from Facebook. Yeah, that's, there's a lot of work as well. Uh, several thousand lines of work, C++ code. Yes. Can you go to the motivation slide where you listed the databases for the serialization uh, verification? Yes. Because you, you said that you're doing serializability but not strict serializability, and strict serializability would be easier, but Google Spanner is strictly serializable. Yes. What are uh, the others? Uh? So, yeah, so uh, Google Spanner, it is uh, strict serializable, yes. And uh, I believe the thing here is uh, for some of the type of the transactions, they're, for example, read-only transactions. So those can be only serializable, but not strict serializable. So because read-only read transactions, they can read from some snapshot. In Google Spanner? Or? Yeah. So for read-only read transactions. And what about the other ones? So for the Crockford DB and Yuga DB, I believe they are above serializability, but below strict serializable. For uh, Aurora, they are strict serializable. Strict so, Yeah. And that level between serializable and strict serializable, what is, what is that, and uh, is that? Yeah, they, they actually, CockroachDB actually has uh, this blog about what exactly the concurrency um, isolation level is. So there are a lot of details. I believe uh, the problem of the, them why it is not strict serializable because they, are, they don't have those atomic clock. So they use some protocol like uh, NTP, so they cannot guarantee, like, guarantee for all the time they are strict serializable. I, I think that's uh, where they have to lose a little bit on the isolation level. Okay, but is it an easier problem to verify thanks due to their attempt to get uh, serializability with respect to the clocks they do have? Okay, so I, I, I'm not think too deep about if for particularly for cockroach db so how easy the question would be but i definitely can say that for the worst case of their workload that that will require to be serializable meaning that still an be complete problem yeah any more questions let's thank the speaker again thank you